2014. And in the 1950s, there was a commentator and journalist by the name of Paul Harvey. How many of you are familiar with, with Paul Harvey? All right, I see, a, I see a few hands, a few smiles of people who remember Paul Harvey. But Paul Harvey was a commentator and a journalist. And something that he did over the course of 40 years from the 1950s to the 1990s is he had a segment in his uh, show, which I don't remember. So if you remember better than me, you can, you can correct me later. But in his show, he had a segment in his show that was called The Rest of the Story. And the rest of the story, he would take something that was well known. He would take a story, an event that was well known, and he would give new or additional perspective to something that most people would already know. So, for example, I was looking at some, some the rest of the story by Paul Harvey this week, and one example was him doing a story on my mom's favorite movie, It's a Wonderful Life. How many of you are familiar with the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, the Christmas movie? Okay, I got, I got some of you, I got some of you. All right, but in It's a Wonderful Life, which ranks by movie critics as one of the, I think, 10 greatest movies of all time, uh, everyone today, or most people today, know about It's a Wonderful Life, the story of George Bailey, a, a community leader in a small town who just always put the good of his community before himself until later on in his life, whenever he got discouraged and depressed because of some mistakes that he made, and he just thought, man, everything would be better if I would have just never been born. So he's driven to the point of suicide, and then a guardian angel named Clarence steps in and gives him this gift to see what his life would have been like, or to see what his community would have been like, rather, if he had never been born. So through the movie, he sees what his town would look like if he had never been born, and then his perspective completely changes. So that's, that's the movie. If you've never seen it, I just, I just gave it to you, okay? Uh, but something that's interesting to know is that this movie that ranks as one of the top 10 movies of all time was actually not popular at all for its first two or three decades after its release. Whenever It's a Wonderful Life was released, it barely broke even at the box office. Uh, it, barely, it barely broke even, and people didn't really watch the movie all that much until 20 or 30 years later, whenever someone that worked in, uh, worked in their studios forgot or just didn't renew the copyright for It's a Wonderful Life. So once they didn't renew the copyright, 20 or 30 years later, it became public domain, which means that any channel that wanted to show the movie could show the movie practically for free. And once that happened, then millions and millions of people started watching the movie, and then it took off. And because someone made a four, didn't pay $4 to renew the copyright, that business lost millions upon millions of dollars. And now you know the rest of the story. Today in Mark chapter 16, we have had a wonderful study where we have been following Jesus. We've seen Jesus love people. We've seen him love individuals. We have seen Jesus perform miracles, doing things that only he can do. Uh, we've seen Jesus suffer. We've seen him bleed. We've seen him die. And last week, we even got to see him rise again. And today, as we look at the rest of Mark, I want to share with you the rest of the story. Uh, because what happens in the rest of the gospel's accounts of Jesus's post-resurrection ministry really does change everything for us so that the end of Jesus's life, the end of Jesus's ministry becomes the beginning for you and for me. Mark chapter 16, and we're going to start reading for our last study in the gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 16 and verse number one. It says, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus and Salome, had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came into the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were afraid. And he saith unto them, Be not afraid, you seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen, he is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goes before you into Galilee. There shall you see him as he said unto you. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. 
Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it unto the residue or to the rest of the disciples, neither believed they them. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and abraded them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name, shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Uh, they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. They went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Let's pray together and then we'll get into God's word. Lord Jesus, we again, we thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you that you give us new life because you came and you suffered and you bled and you died and you were buried and you rose again. And Lord, I ask that you would uh, encourage us. Lord, I ask that you would transform us today because of what we find uh, within the power of your word. Lord, I ask that you'd help us all to, to really uh, zone in into what the scripture has to say. And Lord, I ask that you'd help me as I preach and teach your word today. Help me to say only what you want me to say. And Lord, I ask that you would just do a transforming work in our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Here is the rest of the story. First of all, I want you to notice from the end of the Gospels is that Jesus, here's what Jesus does. Uh, Jesus, if we could go ahead and get it on the screen, Jesus shows up in lives. Uh, Jesus shows up in lives. Here's what the Gospel tells us, that after Jesus' resurrection, Jesus appear, starts appearing to his disciples. And something that the Gospel tells us is that the first person that Jesus appears to is a woman by the name of Mary Magdalene. Uh, you can read about this in the Gospel of John, where Jesus appears to her. Uh, she is at the garden, and uh, she's wanting to anoint Jesus' body, but he's not there. Uh, and then we see that there's a man who comes up to Mary, and, and John it tells about this, that uh, Jesus shows up to Mary, and uh, she says, thinking that he's the gardener, hey, please tell us uh, where you have laid my Lord. Where have you put him? Did you take him away? And Jesus speaks her name. Jesus says, Mary, and she realizes that it's her Savior. And it's an amazing thing to me that Jesus shows up to Mary because if you're writing a story, if you're writing a story and you're trying to just write this to make up Jesus' resurrection, like some people say, uh, some people say that Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. This was just a story. This was just a tale. Uh, and people were just saying that Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, if you look at it from a storytelling point of view, from a first century's perspective, there's no way that you write the story this way. There's no way that you write the story, Jesus appears to this woman named Mary Magdalene. Uh, because in their culture, if you were going to verify a story as true, in their culture, you had to have the witness of two reliable men. You had to have the, the witness of two reliable men. Uh, so, for, for, so first, we see that Jesus appears to not two people, but one. He doesn't show up to two men, he shows up to one woman. And he's not showing up to someone who has this, uh, who is known as being this reliable person of great character. This woman is known as a woman who uh, was involved in witchcraft and who was possessed with demons. And uh, many people believe and say that she was a prostitute. And uh, there was all these things. There was nothing about Mary Magdalene that would say, hey, this is a reliable source unless it just actually is true. You don't write stories. You don't make up stories this way. Uh, my girls have this book that they love at home. It's called The Good Egg. Uh, so there's this good egg that lives under this lives in this carton with these 11 other eggs. And the other eggs' names are like, uh, um, uh, I'm trying to remember, egg, peg, clegg, uh, egg, 
uh, Shell, Shelly, Shelby, Sheldon, uh, Frank, and other Frank. So uh, there's this one good egg, and all the other eggs are bad eggs. And this good egg is trying to, uh, this good egg is just trying to lead a good life and influence the bad eggs to be good eggs. And nothing that they do, that nothing that the good egg does works. So the eggs get so stressed out that the egg starts getting uh, cracks in its shell. So it decides that it has to do something to fix itself. So it leaves the other 11 eggs and goes off on a journey of self-discovery and transformation and the egg goes away. Uh, the egg, get, I don't even remember all the things that the egg does, which I'm kind of surprised because I've had to read it to Brooklyn so many times. Uh, but uh, the, the egg goes and uh, gets therapy and starts working out and uh, goes to a spa and does all these things to repair the cracks and to not feel so scrambled. Uh, okay, I'll let you guys, I'll let you guys, um, I'll, I'll just wait. I'll just move on. I'll just move on. So then ultimately the egg starts to find healing and the egg decides that it's, it's going to make its way back to its carton. Now, if you're writing the story, you don't finish the story by saying, and while the good egg was on its way home, it stumbled and rolled and cracked and its yolk fell out and it died the end. Like, that's not how you write a children's story. I guess unless you're going to write Humpty Dumpty, sat on a wall, Humpty Dumpty, had a great fall. So I guess that one was just already taken. But nonetheless, if you're going to write a fictional story, if you're just going to write a feel-good story, uh, you're not going to say, oh, and whenever Jesus was raised from the dead, what really happened is he showed up to this woman that no one would have believed. Yeah, that's exactly what Jesus does. Jesus shows up in grace and mercy to the unlovable. Jesus shows up in grace and mercy to the unreachable and he calls out her name and says, Mary, I'm right here. I'm raised from the dead. And my friend, if that doesn't get you excited today, then there's something that you have too high of a view of yourself. Not because you and I are broken apart from our Savior. You and I are, are uh, we are just, uh, we're broken and sinful people. There is none righteous, no, not one, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But catch this, God demonstrated his love for you and he demonstrated his love for me and that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us and Jesus shows up in grace and mercy can I ask you this question church can I ask you this question believer if you've received such love if you've received that kind of grace could I ask you this question who are you showing this kind of love and grace to today Who's a person in your life who's, who's unlovable? Who's a person in your life that you would view as unreachable? Can I tell you something? That Jesus cares about that person because Jesus cared about you. Jesus cared about me. So let's be, let's be busy about showing the love of Jesus, loving like Jesus. We see that Jesus shows up to Mary Magdalene. But the next thing that we see in the, in the story, the next thing that we see after Jesus' resurrection is he shows up to Mary, but then he starts shaping disciples with his word. He starts shaping disciples with the word. Here in the text, it tells us that Jesus showed up to two other disciples that were going off into the country. You can read about that in Luke 24. In Luke 24, Jesus, there are two disciples. There's two followers of Jesus who are leaving town and they are, uh, they're broken. They're brokenhearted. They're devastated uh, because Jesus has died and he's buried. So they're leaving. And then it tells us that Jesus shows up, but he's not recognizable to these two other disciples. These, other, these two disciples, these two followers of Jesus, because of the work of Jesus, I believe something miraculous is going on here. Uh, but, they, but Jesus shows up and he starts talking with them along the way. He says, in essence, hey, why are you guys so, why are you guys so downhearted? Hey, why are you guys so devastated? Why are you guys so upset? And they answered to Jesus, not knowing that it's Jesus. They answered to him, well, haven't you heard? Haven't you heard? Everybody, everybody in Jerusalem knows what's going on. Jesus, who we had our hope in as the Messiah, we had our faith in him that he was going to redeem Israel. We believed in him, but he's dead. He's dead. And the Bible tells us that Jesus then uh, rebukes them, and he says, don't you understand the scriptures? Don't you understand? And it says that he started from the beginning. And he showed them that from the law, he showed them from uh, the prophets, he showed them from the Psalms, that, that the Messiah had to suffer. The Messiah had to give his life. The Messiah had to, uh, had to be a sacrifice for their sakes. And he starts shaping them by his 
word. That's the rest of the story is that Jesus begins to shape his disciples by his word. Could I ask you this question, church? Are you being shaped by the word of God? Are you being shaped by the word of God? Is God's word changing you? It should. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, but we all beholding as in a glass or a mirror, the glory of the Lord are changed from glory to glory. Uh, God is changing us. The spirit of God is changing us as we look into the word. The same way that a person changes their appearance, the, way, the, way that, the same way that a person changes their looks by looking at a mirror in the morning. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, my hair, uh, well, I mean, it, it just doesn't look good. It, but whenever I get up in the morning, my hair doesn't look like this. Uh, whenever I get up in the morning and I look in the mirror, I have like drool coming on my face. It's gross. I won't paint any more pictures. But when I look in the mirror, then I make changes to my appearance. I make sure that my clothes are hopefully matching. I get Adriana's help with that. But, but whenever I look into a mirror, there are changes that happens to me. And whenever we look into the word of God, it has that same effect where the Holy Spirit transforms us. Remember our definition of sanctification, where the Holy Spirit of God takes the word of God and applies it to the life of the child of God to make us all more like the son of God. Jesus is on a mission. The Holy Spirit is on a mission to transform you, to shape you, and to mold you to be more like himself. And that is the rest of the story. That's what Jesus is doing in your life and in my life. He's transforming us. Hey, we're not what we used to be. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Uh, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And that's what God does by his word. Could I challenge you? Could I encourage you today? If you're not a part of our Thursday life groups, could I challenge you to jump in? We meet Thursdays at 630. Uh, Tim is leading our main life group and they just started the, the book of James. And if you want your life to be shaped and molded by the word of God, let me encourage you to come. Let me encourage you to show up and hear and learn from God's word. Let's be, let's be a church that is shaped and molded by the word of God. That's why we walk verse by verse by verse through books of the Bible. And I'm just going to like put in a little, a little plug right now that I'm really excited about. Once we finish Mark, we're going to take a couple of week break while we get ready for Easter. And I'm going to talk to you guys more about Easter in just a second. But on April 11th, we're starting our next book of the Bible. Uh, we're going to walk through, um, we're going to walk through the book of first Thessalonians uh, the book of 1 Thessalonians, and we're going to talk about what a spiritually healthy soul looks like. Uh, we're going to talk about what it takes to have a healthy soul. It's going to shape us. It's going to transform us. Let me encourage you to be a part. Let me encourage you to be getting into God's word. So Jesus shows up to Mary Magdalene. Then Jesus shows up to these two disciples. And then we see that Jesus begins to correct his disciples. Jesus begins to correct his disciples. Now, I want you to look with me at verse number 14. It says, afterward, he appeared unto the 11. Uh, they're sitting at dinner. They sit at meat, and he abraded them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Uh, so Jesus shows up to his disciples that did not believe him. And here in the text, it says that he abraded them. He rebuked them. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever I read that word upbraided, Abraded. Like, I know that we don't use that word anymore, but that's like, that just sounds intense. Like, it just sounds scary. Like, he abraded, uh, he abraded the group. Uh, he rebuked them. You know, as I looked at it, I thought, you know, man, that sounds really intense. That sounds kind of scary. Kind of like uh, whenever I was in high school, my, my basketball coach in high school, he was someone, he just, he tried to channel his inner Bobby Knight, if you know who that is. Like he would take chairs and he would pick them up and he would threaten to throw them across the gym. And I'll never forget one day uh, I was playing and I guess I was playing pretty horribly. He took me, like this isn't halftime, this is in the middle of a game. He pulls me off the court and he takes me to the locker room, like mid game. Like he just, he just stopped coaching. Uh, I stopped playing, he took me to a locker room and then he punched one of the lockers and put a dent in the visitor's locker room. Uh, and he, he punched it. He's like, uh, I don't remember what he said. I was kind of in shock. And then he sent me back, then he sent me back out onto the court to keep on playing. That's my idea of abrading. My idea of abrading is, uh, Tim, you remember this. Our college coach, our college coach, it didn't matter if you were winning by 20. Uh, he was going to, uh, man, you, didn't, you weren't looking forward to halftime. I don't remember one time, I, I think there was maybe one time where he had something not mean to say, like where he didn't yell at us uh, at halftime. 
we were, I can't, I think it was like, what, there was one game where we were winning really big, which honestly, it just didn't happen very often. It just, it didn't happen. But he walked up there and he didn't have anything mean to say. Like his mantra, his mantra was, you know, most people say, like my wife, my, uh, some people say like, hey, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it at all. His mantra was, if you don't have anything mean to say, don't say it at all. Like it was just a scary thing. His face would get super red. And he was just like, he was ready to kill you at halftime. It didn't matter what was going on. That's my idea of upbraiding. But when you look at the rest of the Gospels, when you look at the rest of the Gospels, I don't know, I don't know what's, what's worse. Um, but when you look at the, the rest of the Gospels, how Jesus upbraided, how he rebuked his disciples, honestly was a lot more tender and kind and compassionate, but also a lot more deeply painful and convicting. And I believe it's John, you can read about the group had seen Jesus. The group had seen Jesus, but one of them was missing. His name was Thomas. Uh, some people call him Doubting Thomas, or Thomas the Doubter. And the 10 disciples, they had seen Jesus and they tell Thomas, Thomas, Jesus is alive and we've seen him. And Thomas says to them, hey guys, I'm not gonna believe Jesus, I'm not gonna believe that Jesus is alive unless I can take my hands, unless I can take my fingers and I can drive them into the prints, into the holes in his hands. I'm not going to believe that Jesus is alive unless I can take my fist and I can put it into his pierced side. Uh, I'm not going to believe it unless all of those things happen. And then what happens next? Jesus shows up and he says, Thomas, come here. Take your fingers, put them in my hands. Take your fist, put it in my side. And it says that it drove Thomas to his knees, crying, my Lord and my God, because the way Jesus' upbraiding looked as it was deeply, it was deeply painful and convicting, but it was kind and gracious. You, rem you remember, Jesus, if all of these other guys, if all of them forsake you, if all of them deny you, hey, hey, I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to stay faithful to you, Jesus. You remember that. Peter, do you love me more than these? Peter, Peter, do you love me? <laughs> it was kind and gracious, but it was deeply painful. Friend, can I encourage you? Can I challenge you with this? Embrace that conviction because where that conviction happens, there is cleansing. And it's not this, it's not this angry Jesus that hates you. It's this Jesus who loves you and wants to shape you and mold you to be the person that God wants you to be. And it's not, it doesn't always taste good. So if you had kids and tried to, tried to give them, uh, try to give them, you know, cough syrup, it doesn't taste good, but it's for their benefit. Hey, sometimes the Holy Spirit works in our hearts and it's painful. But let's embrace it because it's, it's, it's from a gracious and loving God. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Father loves, he chastens, yet even as every son that he receives. So we see Jesus is shaping his disciples, he's correcting his disciples, he's revealing himself to his disciples. So that's what we see. We see Jesus shows up in lives. The next thing that I want you to notice is this, Jesus gives the Great Commission. Jesus gives the Great Commission. In verse 15, it says, He said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We see this commission given in, in Matthew 28. We see this in Luke 24. We see this in Acts 1, the Great Commission. Now, I want you guys to say that with me, all right? So, the Great Commission, all right? Let's say that one more time. The Great Commission, all right? A lot of Christians don't know what that is, but it's so important that we understand this because the Great Commission is the divine mission given by God to believers to take the good news, to take the gospel to the world, to our, to our friends and neighbors, to our city, to our country, to our world, to take the good news of Jesus and to see them uh, made into disciples. That's the way Matthew's language is. Go and teach all nations. Go and make 
disciples. We're supposed to replicate our lives into other people so that they know the Savior that we know and love and become committed followers of him. That's the Great Commission, to go, to win people to the Lord Jesus Christ, to, to baptize them and, and to teach them how to, to teach them to follow our Savior, to be made disciples who then go out and make disciples. That is the Great Commission. The Great Commission is to see people. Uh, you know, we are for, we are all for uh, serving our community by doing things like we did uh, not too long ago where we, where we did a grill out here and where we fed people in need. But you know what? The greatest need of every single soul is not a one meal in their belly that, uh, that they'll, they'll forget about tomorrow. It's not the greatest need that a person has is not uh, warm clothes. The greatest need that a person has is not new shoes. The greatest need that a person has is to be born again and to have a relationship with God. So we're going to serve our community and we're going to serve our neighborhood. But our ultimate goal is to see people who did not know Jesus Christ as their Savior, people who were on their way to hell, experience a relationship with Jesus Christ so they can be born into God's family and experience a real and personal relationship with God. That is our purpose and that is our mission. And that's something that Jesus gave to the church, which means that we as a gathering of believers take seriously and we are we are responsible for we are responsible for so how do we as a church how can we be a part of fulfilling the great commission all right and we're going to get we're going to we're going to learn to do this together all right we're going to as a church we are going to grow in this together but our first step all right so if you're if you want to fulfill this great commission to see people come to faith in jesus christ and be made disciples here's like step one for us okay <laughs> First step for us is an opportunity that we have on April 4th, on April 4th. Mark your calendar, and if you have your notes, there's a gray block that I want you to look at. There's a gray block I want you to look at in your notes, but April 4th, 2021 is Easter, is Easter. It's where we celebrate the resurrection, and people who don't go to church, they'll go to church on Easter Sunday. So we want to prepare, we want to prepare to give the gospel two people on Easter Sunday. Here's how you can be a part, all right? The first thing that you can do is pray, pray. Pray for people to come to faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, be praying for that. And we're gonna be sharing some things in the future about ways that we're going to develop this, but we're going to, we're going to pray. And I'm gonna ask you to pray for Easter Sunday that people will come to faith in Christ. Start inviting people. You have friends, you have neighbors, you have people that you know. And if you notice in the block there, I want, this is important. Uh, in the block, it says, invite people uh, lost or unchurched. Lost or unchurched. All right, this isn't, this isn't the time to say, hey, you know what, I'm going to start, I'm going to go invite uh, my family member that goes to this other church every single week. Uh, I'm going to get them to come to my church with me on Sunday. No, we want to share the gospel. You know, and that, you know, there's, I'm, there's nothing wrong with that. But let's share the gospel with people who do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Let's invite people on Easter Sunday to, let's invite people who do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Let's invite people who are not churched and let's see Jesus transform their lives on Easter Sunday. So invite. Uh, the next thing, and I might miss one because I don't have it, I don't have it on me, but we want to give. We want to give. All right, and I, I'm, normally I don't push so hard on giving, but today I'm going, to, I'm going to share with you from my heart a need that we have to give. All right, we want to share the gospel with our community. We do, we do. And I wish that it didn't, I wish that it didn't. And like, if you're watching it online, like, hey, this is just, this is family talk for a little bit, okay? Um, I wish that it didn't take money, but to reach people in our community with the gospel, it takes, it takes money. It takes money to, 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 to mail invitations. It takes money to, to do things like, like serve food to the homeless and to serve food in our community. It takes money to do all of those things. And I'm not asking you to give, I'm not trying to twist your arm and I'm not trying to make you, I'm not, I know that there are hurting people in this room, but I'm just saying, if the Holy Spirit would lead you to give out of a love for Jesus, would you give so that we can give the gospel to people? And I promise you this, every new gift that we get here at church, every new gift that we get is going to be going into reaching people with the gospel, with the gospel. So could I encourage you to give? Uh, and could I encourage you to serve? Could I encourage you to serve? Um, we are going to be sharing different opportunities in the upcoming weeks on different ways that you can serve. 
but could I, could I encourage you as a church, let's gather together, let's rally together and take the next eight weeks, the next eight weeks, the next four as we prepare for Easter, uh, the next four as, we, as we're inviting people to uh, a, a picture of health, our study through First Thessalonians, as, we, as people come in and get saved and we want to get them plugged into our church family, would you just say, uh, would you say, hey, I am all in to serve for the next eight weeks because I believe that through us rallying together and all doing our part and all serving and all giving and all reaching and inviting, we're going to see lives transformed by the power of the gospel. That is the mission that Jesus gave to us. He gave the great commission. And then finally, I want to share this with you. I want to share this with you. Uh, First, Jesus shows up in lives. Jesus gives the great commission. And then I want you to notice this. Jesus reigns in glory. Jesus reigns in glory because Jesus is still king. Jesus is still king. Look with me at these last at these last verses, I do want to. I do want to just um, read verses sixteen through eighteen, and I want to make a note on this. This is not. I'm not really preaching this. This is before Jesus reigns in glory. But let me back up because I want to highlight something to you if you see it in your Bible. Um, verses sixteen through eighteen. He says, "He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned." All right. Now, part of my role as the pastor of this church, as the as the primary teacher of this church, is to teach you good doctrine. Okay, so it's easy to look at a verse like that and to get a little bit confused. So, all right, so I want to give you some good doctrine for a second, right? Some people look at this verse where it says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned as teaching that in order to have eternal life, you have to, you have to, um, you have to believe and then you have to get baptized. And if you don't get baptized, then you are not saved. And if you don't get baptized, then you're going to spend eternity separated from God in hell. That's not what the Bible teaches, and that's not what this verse teaches. Okay? So look at this with me. Look at this with me. It says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But then the next part of it says, But he that believeth not shall be damned. Okay? So there's the first part is, Hey, believe and be baptized, and you're saved. If you don't believe, then you are... The word here is damned, which we don't use... We don't use uh, profitably or we don't use it in this, this way anymore, but basically it means to be condemned, to be condemned, all right? So it's saying, hey, you are condemned if you don't believe, all right? A person is saved, a person is born into God's family whenever they put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone for salvation. Now, the first step of obedience for every new believer is to be baptized, And in the first century, that was a huge step because their culture wasn't a Christian culture or a post-Christian culture, a free culture like it is today. Uh, They had very strong, uh, it was, everyone was Jewish. So to put your faith in Jesus Christ, that step of baptism was a major public commitment that just went in hand with believing Jesus. All right, so it's kind of put together in that verse, but I want you to know, I want you to be assured that you're not saved by being baptized. All right, baptism is something that I do in obedience to Jesus because I have been saved. And since we're on that subject, I want to I want to ask you this question: Are you saved? Do you know Jesus as your Savior? Have you been born into God's family? If you don't know that for sure, then at the end of the service, I'm going to pray and we're going to have a final worship song. I'm going to stand in the back, and if you say, Pastor David, I do not know for sure that I'm saved. I don't know for sure that I'm on my way to heaven, but I would like to know. I'm going to stand in the back so you don't even have to, you don't have to be embarrassed by walking up to the front. I'll stand in the back. Come talk to me and I would love to show you from the Bible how you can know for sure that you're on your way to heaven. That's what verse 16 teaches. And then there's verses 17 and 18. And this one gets, uh, this one gets fun too. It says, these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. I shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So Jesus talks about these these sign gifts, which we don't have time to take today because I want to get you home to lunch. Uh, We don't have time today to spend a lot of time on these sign gifts, but there's a lot of discussion and there's a lot of of debate on sign gifts. All right, now I want to I say this to you because we're, we're gonna, I need to give you uh, the doctrine of our church. I need to give you what we believe, all right? But hang with me. If you disagree on this, come talk to me. I, would lo- I feel like it would be much more profitable for us to have a personal conversation over this than for me to just uh, 
try to try to villainize you from the pulp, make you feel villainized, or make you feel like our make you feel like my enemy if you disagree with me on this. So let me say this: I'm going to share with you our church's doctrine, what we believe, what I believe with all my heart. The Bible teaches, and then if you disagree with me, come have a conversation with me. I would love a conversation. Okay, you ready for this? Here's what we believe: we believe that these sign gifts described in the end of Mark 16, uh, which Jesus describes four. Uh, he describes speaking in new tongues. He talks about casting out uh, devils. He talks about taking up serpents. He talks about drinking poison. All right, so those are, those are the four signs. We believe uh, that these gifts, uh, these sign gifts, like speaking in tongues, drinking poison, um, those things are done. Those things do not continue today scripturally. All right, and we can have a long conversation, especially if you're, especially if you're a person who came from a charismatic background uh, that believes in speaking in tongues. All right, and we can have a conversation about this. Okay, but here is our position as a church: we don't believe that that continues today. Okay, now here's a couple things to note throughout Scripture. We could have a long conversation about this throughout Scripture, but I do want you to notice is that Jesus put these 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 sign gifts together. Most people are cool. Uh, a lot of people are cool with speaking in tongues. Most people, most of those same people are not cool with drinking deadly poison and snake handling. All right? If you believe in speaking in tongues and you also take up snakes and you also drink poison, you get the trump card. I won't, I won't, I won't fight you. Okay? So, but when you look at the gifts described in Scripture, the purpose of these gifts was a, was a, a sign, a picture for these apostles for these apostles, that, that what Jesus had done, what Jesus had said was true. That was the purpose. So look in Acts chapter 2, whenever the disciples, when the apostles spoke in tongues, the apostle preached, everyone heard it in their own language. That's speaking in tongues, okay? Here's a reason why I personally don't believe in speaking in tongues. There's two times in the New Testament where Jesus describe where, where the Bible describes, I'm sorry, the New Testament describes speaking in tongues. I believe it's in Romans and it's in 1 Corinthians. In Romans and 1 Corinthians, where it talks about gifts. In 1 Corinthians, it does talk about sign gifts and it does talk about speaking in tongues. And Peter gives instruction for speaking in tongues. And if you look at the instructions that Paul gives in 1 Corinthians 14, and the practices of churches today that speak in tongues, they are not following the instruction that was given to them in 1 Corinthians 14. All right, so, and that's a long conversation that we can have another day. But in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul gives instructions for what that was to look like at that time, and churches today don't follow that. And then in Romans, which was written after 1 Corinthians, gifts are again talked about, and tongues are not mentioned. So you see early on, it's, you see it in, early in Acts, and the longer that time goes, the more it fades out, all right? And if you want to talk about that more, uh, I would love to have the conversation with you. Um, I would love to have the conversation with you. And you can disagree with me, and we can have a conversation and be friends, and I'll still love you. But that is the position of our church. That's the doctrine of our church, okay? Um, so that's, that is what we see in verses 17 and 18. So that's our doctrine. Now, verses 19 and 20, and I know that we are, I'm running, I'm running late. So I'm just going to share this with you, and then we'll be done. Finally, Jesus reigns in glory. Jesus reigns in glory. Uh, in verse number 20, in verse number 19, it says, So after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God of God. And that is the rest of the story. In Acts chapter 1 and verse number 9, we see after Jesus had spoken these things, he ascends up into glory and gives the promise that just like he left, he is coming back again. And in Philippians chapter 2, it tells us that he is seated at the right hand of God. And then in your notes, you see Ephesians chapter 1. And Paul's prayer is this. Paul prays this, that you have a relationship with Jesus. You have the power of God working in you, the same power that raised him from the dead that raised Jesus from the dead and has seated him at the right hand of God, it says in Ephesians chapter one. Hey, our prayer is that you would know and live in the, the, live in the beauty of that, that you live in the beauty of the rest of the story, that Jesus gave himself for you, that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again so that you could have new life in him, so you could have new life in him. So church, as we finish the gospel of Mark, let me challenge you to live like Jesus is still king. Let me encourage you to experience that new life. 
Let me encourage you to follow Jesus. Let me encourage you to live the end of the beginning because the end of Jesus' life, the gospel makes all the difference in your life and in my life today. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you. Thank you for giving yourself for us, for giving us a relationship with you, and then for giving us a great commission to not just experience the new life ourselves, but to share that with those around us. And Lord, I ask that you would empower us by your Holy Spirit to live this new life that you offer. Spirit of God, please work and move in this time. If there's a person who does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior, whether it be online or in person, may they receive you today. We'll give you all the honor and glory. Lord, I ask that you would shape us, that you'd transform us, that you'd convict us, and that you'd make us new. Because that's what you offered when you gave yourself for us. We love you, Lord. Please bless the close of our service in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would all stand, we're going to worship together, singing to our Savior one final song. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior and you'd like to know more about that, I'm going to stand in the back. Come talk to me. And I'd love to show you from the Bible how you can know Christ as your Savior. Let's close.